This video is brought to you by Squarespace, the all-in-one website creation platform. I spent quite a while wondering how I was going to start this video, and then it struck me. Why not start it the same way the movies do? One, two... Okay, to add a little bit of context, I went to the North Staffordshire Symphony Orchestra and I said to them, hey, if I give you an hour or two, do you think you could play me the Star Wars theme? And to my surprise, they said, that's not a whole lot of time, but we'll certainly give it a go. Now, I expected to sit back and enjoy the show, but this is Juan, the conductor, and Juan had other ideas. And in what I can only describe as a make-a-wish-like gesture during the final take, he decided to simultaneously humiliate me and also fulfill one of my biggest childhood dreams, allowing me to give conducting a go. <laughs> you won't actually to, to have a go, but... <laughs> Now, I don't know if you know this, or if you can tell by my face, but I don't know the first thing about trying to conduct an orchestra. But I wasn't about to turn this opportunity up, so I'm gonna slice in footage of me giving it a go every now and then, and we're all gonna pretend like I know what I'm doing, and that I'm really good at it. Deal? Okay, great. One, two... Hello there, future Johnny from... Well, the future, and I'm sure some of you have already seen this coming. Uh, yeah, it's only now that I've just uploaded the video that I've remembered, huh, YouTube has a copyright system, and YouTube's copyright system really doesn't like the idea of this introduction. <laughs> it took me so long to get this organized and recorded, and I can't even use it because I didn't even think about the copyright system. Ah, uh, this is painful, and it's one of those moments when I realize just how stupid I am. I uh, just thought I'd let you know, and on with the video. I think it's fair to say that my performance in front of the orchestra was nothing short of a complete disaster. But it was the most fun I've had in a very long time, and I did get to speak with a number of the members of the orchestra who said that they were over the moon, no pun intended, to be, uh, to be given the chance to play that piece of music. So, you know, it was a great time to be a Star Wars fan. And with that, allow me to welcome you to what is the second episode of Never Again, a series where I look at some of the greatest pieces of entertainment. And today we are, of course, watching the Star Wars original, and I can't stress that enough, original trilogy. But before we get into all that, a word from today's sponsor. And this video is brought to you by Squarespace, the all-in-one website creation platform, which is designed to be as easy to use as possible, so even you, Yes, you over there with no web design skills, even you can have your very own shiny looking professional website up and running in a matter of minutes. You can utilize Squarespace's comprehensive tutorials and templates, or you can even hire one of Squarespace's experts to help polish off your website or even help build one from scratch for you. Whatever your needs or skill level, Squarespace will help you to get to where you want to be in no time at all. And for those of you who are a little more savvy, you can take full advantage of the Squarespace design suite, track in-depth analytics, seamlessly integrate your favorite applications and even edit your website on the go from the Squarespace app. So to get you started, head on over to squarespace.com forward slash Johnny Law and use code Johnny Law at checkout to get 10% off your first website or domain. And a big thank you to Squarespace for sponsoring this video. Now, I think it's fair to say that the golden era of sci-fi and fantasy is regrettably long gone. And I'm not just talking years, I'm talking decades at this point. In fact, I'd recommend brushing up on your ancient Greek in order to use language accurate enough to quantify just how long it's been since the ever adulated good old days. Sci-fi was good when you used to get beaten up for watching it. That's when you know it's good. Even a good old-fashioned playground ass whooping from the school bully couldn't deter you from running around like one of your favorite star pilots. You're not dyslexic, you're just really, really stupid. As about the turn of the century, a great migration began. Now, I'm not talking about schools of salmon or herds of wildebeest. I'm talking about something far less sophisticated. The normie. Shh, we don't want to startle it. Did you see that one bit where Baby Yoda ate all those eggs? As if, am I right? Best episode for real for real. Now, the normie might not be rare, but that doesn't make it any less fascinating. The normie filter feeds at a surface level and consists on a diet of that which has been recommended to them exclusively by the mainstream media and their brain-dead peer groups. When Ray said that she was Ray Skywalker and not Ray Palpatine, I clapped and cried, so relatable and real. Absolutely remarkable. 
Jokes aside, here is a rough timeline of the great sci-fi migration. Star Wars releases. Nerds enjoy Star Wars. Normies bully nerds for enjoying Star Wars because they have nothing better to enjoy themselves. Star Wars eventually becomes mainstream and normies want a piece of the action. Nerds welcome the previously hostile group under the illusion that they can all unite under the banner of 1977's finest. Oh, how wrong they were. Disney then acquires Star Wars and nerds aren't too happy with the trajectory of the franchise and decide to voice their grievances, or as I like to call them, their general grievances. <laughs> Get it, okay, that's not funny. But upon hearing these critical takes, the previously hostile normies that were eventually forgiven and welcomed in by nerds then proceed to ostracize those very same nerds, labeling them as toxic for daring to speak negatively about their beloved franchise. You enjoy a thing. People bully you for enjoying that thing. The people who bullied you for enjoying that thing then begin pretending to enjoy that thing that they bullied you for enjoying, and then begin to kick you out of that group for not enjoying the thing the same way that they enjoy that thing. It's, it's the circle of life. Now, there are multiple editions of the original trilogy you can watch. I would personally recommend either Harmony's Despecialized or 4K77, but to avoid any litigious shenanigans, that's hard to say, we're, gonna, we're just gonna be watching the version that is provided to us by our good old friends at Disney Plus. <laughs> oh yes. Oh, I love what you did with the place, guys. Really good stuff. <laughs> And with that out of the way, let's watch one of the greatest trilogies ever made. Now, if you've watched any of my previous videos, you might be aware of the fact that one of my least favorite things on this planet is exposition. You know, you've got homelessness, famine, poverty, and then right at the top you've got exposition. It, it's just the worst. And Star Wars kicks off with what is essentially one giganto scrolling exposition dump. So, uh, so what have you got to say about that, Johnny? Huh? If it, yeah, if it sucks so bad, why don't you why don't you say something bad about this? It, it's the Star Wars introduction, one of the most iconic introductions ever in cinema. Why don't you go ahead and say something bad about that then, huh? Well, in fairness to Star Wars, yes, they did exposition dump, and that is, you know, maybe a little bit lazy, could be considered a little bit boring by some, but they did also show us the respect and gave us what is one of, if not the most iconic cinema introduction sequence ever, and also one of the, if not the, greatest scores ever committed to film. And the fact that they use text rather than visual or spoken exposition, it helps us to appreciate and indulge those things that little bit more. If even the giant text dump section of your movie is considered iconic, you know you did a good. You know you did something right. It's not about what you do, it's about how you do it. And a lot of people don't know this, but A New Hope actually opens with a shot of the Millennium Falcon. At least what the Millennium Falcon almost looked like. The Tantif design derived from early conceptions of the Falcon, but there was speculation that this design had taken some unintentional inspiration from a ship that featured in a TV show that was running at the time called Space 1999. And so George Lucas came up with a solution to this problem, and that solution can only be described as very American. And George wanted something different. He said something, well, make the ship kind of like a hamburger. <laughs> Sorry, Americans. You know, it's always amused me how this stormtrooper is conscientious enough to reassure his fellow troopers that Leia will be just fine after she's just been stunned. But he doesn't even bat an eyelid at the fact that his buddy has just been dropped like a sack of taters right in front of him by the same woman. Now, ironically, Star Wars and Disney actually have something in common, or at least they used to. And that was their ability to bring character to that which may otherwise have seemed lacking. R2-D2 is a pedal bin that doesn't speak a word of English, and C-3PO is a camp art deco pinup who has the mobility of a geriatric breeze block. But they are two of the most sympathetic characters from the movie. These are both hallmarks of Star Wars and Disney. Well, at least old Disney. New Disney actually struggles to bring character to those who have faces and emotions and are alive. And I've also got a confession to make. Because, you know, I would identify as a relatively hardcore Star Wars fan, but it's only dawning on me at this moment, whilst watching, that the gonk droids are called gonk droids. Now get this, because the noises that they make sound like the word gonk. <laughs> really hope that's not the case, I'm gonna have to look it up. Ah, oh, no, that is the case. Oh, I think, I think I might be stupid.
We're now at the mercy of machines and a battle the likes of which we've never seen before is about to begin. Men and women have spent up to six months building these machines and in the next 30 minutes, most of them are going to be smashed. Now, I can't speak on behalf of all fans, but for me, one of the scenes from the Star Wars trilogy that encapsulates exactly what it is that I love about this trilogy and why it spoke to me from such a young age is this one. No dialogue, subtle bit of John Williams in the background and Luke embodying the audience, looking out at the sunset, wondering what was beyond them and yearning to find out. A feeling that resonates with, I would imagine, most young boys, myself included. I still get goosebumps every time I watch that scene. You know, the story might be set in a galaxy far, far away, but the themes that run through these movies are as terrestrial as they come. Timeless ideals are just one of the many reasons that the original trilogy has already managed to age better than the sequel trilogy that has had an almost 40 year head start. <laughs> An iconic scene to be sure, but I personally prefer the original cut of this scene before all of the fancy sound effects were put in and you can really hear the, you know, the, the underwhelming bonk noises really are some of the greatest I've ever heard. Sure. Cut and print. Oh yeah, now that's more like it. Ah yes, Sir Alec Guinness. Truly one of the great British thespians. And if you've ever wondered why it is that he managed to get his knighthood, it was for his impeccable pronunciation of the word evil. A young Jedi named Darth Vader, who was a pupil of mine until he turned to evil. Absolutely outstanding. He, of course, embodied one of the most beloved characters from the Star Wars franchise, but Sir Alec Guinness famously didn't like George Lucas's writing quite as much as people liked Obi-Wan. He said to the BBC, and I quote, although the dialogue was appalling, <laughs> there was something about it which made you go on turning the pages. Now, if that doesn't sing glowing endorsement, I don't know what does. Please, Sir Alec, teach me of the Force. What does it do? Now, the Force is what gives the Jedi his power. It's an energy field created by all living things. Okay. It surrounds us. Yeah, all right. Binds the galaxy together. Okay. Penetrates us. Hey, wait, whoa, <laughs> hold on. Ah, uh, yeah, pause. Don't know about that one, Chief. And these last points, too accurate for sand people. Only Imperial stormtroopers are so precise. Are you sure about that? Enter everyone who has good tastes, favorite character. Yeah, Oscar. Yes, I bet you have. My clunky. And also probably my favorite actor. Did you shoot Greedo first or did Greedo shoot you first? Um, I don't care. Man, I can really see why people hate most, if not all of the additions they made to these movies. If you didn't know, the original trilogy was re-released in 1997, 2004, and 2011. And each of these releases saw various alterations and additions to the original. And the CG Jabra in this scene is one of them. And oh boy, it looks janky. It has without question aged far worse than any shot from the original cut. Now I'm not entirely sure why, but they actually filmed this scene before they'd even finalized the design of Jabba the Hutt. And in part of this uh, additional section, Han Solo actually refers to him as a human being. But obviously we all know that Jabba the Hutt isn't, but then they added this scene in after the fact. So after his design was finalized and that he wasn't a human, but they still put it in and... Let Jada. Jabba, you're a wonderful human being. And I tell you what, I don't know if it's nostalgia talking, but they really don't build sets like they used to, do they? How many times have you been watching a modern movie and get distracted by the fact that everything is CG or clearly made of styrofoam? Meanwhile, I'm watching this almost, what, half a century later, and it still looks great. Just a classic opus where a young boy finds adventure and saves the galaxy. Many of us were formally introduced to the world of sci-fi thanks to this film, and it is always a pleasure to watch. Although those positive sentiments might not quite have been shared by those who were working behind the scenes in order to get this movie into cinemas. Due to the explosive success of A New Hope, a lot of people don't know or brush over the fact that the making of A New Hope was nothing short of a nightmare from start 
up until the day of its premiere. Delays, extreme conditions, enormous costs, a disturbing lack of faith in George's vision from both the studio and those working on set with him. In fact, it got so tough for George at one point that during production, he checked himself into a hospital suspecting that he was suffering from a heart attack. Fortunately, that was not the case. And after the release of A New Hope, there was plenty of fan speculation about Luke's love life. Was he going to end up with the girl? In this case, that was Princess Leia. And then uh, George Lucas, of course, came along with the surprisingly subversive... You ever heard of uh, incest before? You gotta respect a guy who, in the face of fan speculation, dives both feet first into the incest button. Simps denied. Who is she? She's beautiful. Simp! Simp! And it would seem that George is a bit of a sadist, as it appears to be a bit of a ritual to begin shooting his movies in some of the least hospitable conditions possible. A New Hope began filming in the Tunisian desert, where they were experiencing some of the highest temperatures on record. And Empire Strikes Back began filming in the frozen tundras of Norway, where they're experiencing the worst winter they'd had there in over 50 years. And by my calculation, if they continued at this trajectory, that means that The Force Awakens would have began filming on the surface of the sun, if only they'd actually done that. This is just a friendly reminder that Johnny is occasionally paid to make these videos and strives to bring you only the best commentary. You know, I'm looking at the X-Wing and I've got to say, it looks a lot like a penis. A cool penis, but a penis nonetheless. Please stay tuned for more of the internet's finest commentary. Hang on, kid. This may smell bad, kid. Probably it'll keep you warm. What? You're looking like you'd never cut open a dead animal and stuffed your homie inside it before. What's wrong with you? Now, I'm pretty sure that I've seen Bear Grylls do something quite similar to this. So if you are quite squeamish, definitely don't Google Bear Grylls sleeps inside a camel. You won't like that. Ah, yes, the Battle of Hoth. Chef's kiss. What's better than this? Guys being dudes. It's just cool. You got AT-ATs, snow speeders, trench warfare, and don't forget this mad lad with the Dreamcast controller on the front lines. Man, I love miniatures. That's such a great shot. Looking? Found someone you have, I would say. <laughs> right. Ah, yes. Puppet Yoda. They were simpler times and, dare I say, better times too. Uh, here's a good laugh for those of you that don't know. Here's a side-by-side -side of Yoda and Stuart Freeborn, the guy who finalised the design of Yoda. Now, do you notice anything in particular? <laughs> <laughs> and though the canny resemblance is somewhat humorous, it's got to be tough to be asked to design a little green nutsack, only to look in the mirror and think, huh, I've got an idea. You know, to this day, I have no idea how they managed to pull off Yoda without it coming off like a complete joke. Right, imagine this. Picture the scene. You've got to pitch to the executives the sequel to the highest grossing movie of all time. They say to you, so, what have you got? And you tell them, well... There's going to be a little tiny green nutsack who lives in a swamp. He goes mmm, a lot and doesn't really speak English properly. Let's face it, they're going to have you sent to the vet to be put down. But some of you might already be writing your comment. Um, but Johnny, with all the money that George Lucas made from the first film, he had the freedom to go independent. And that's what he did do. So he had no executives to answer to. And you're absolutely right. And so the point that I'm making is imagine how many iconic characters themes and designs wouldn't have made it into these films had they been funded by a studio. You cannot tell me that a studio would have green-lighted this. Fine, 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 R2. Fine. I've got to say, the flying Darth Vader T-pose has to be one of the, the greatest pieces of combat I've seen since, I don't know, Yo Jimbo. Uh. <laughs> then, and get this, we find out that Darth Vader is actually Luke's father. Wow. I didn't know that. I just, uh, you're telling me now for the first time. I wonder if Mark Hamill ever had a, no, I am your grandfather <laughs> moment. <laughs> what? Too soon? Oh, and did we ever get an explanation as to why Lando helps himself to Solo's wardrobe? Like, dude, come on. He, he, he's just been freeze dried and you're stealing his stuff. What, you think we wouldn't notice? And so concludes Empire. And if you didn't know, George Lucas was actually fined, I believe it was more than quarter of a million dollars. It was either quarter of a million or was it 25 million dollars? It was, 
Either way, it was a lot of money. The Screen Actors Guild and uh, it was the Directors Guild, I believe, slapped him with this fine. And that was for putting the title sequence at the end of the movie rather than at the start, which was traditional at that time. Obviously, that was to maintain the iconic Star Wars introduction that we all know, you know, the side scroll in exposition dump that we talked about earlier. So, you know, it sounds like a bit of a shakedown to me, but he paid the fine and it was worth it, I reckon. And finally, Return of the Jedi or Revenge of the Jedi, depending on your outlook. And once again, they had a pretty tough time with production. After the success of the first two films, whenever Lucas and his team tried to organize sets and shooting locations, everyone was ripping them off because they just assumed that money was no object for them. So in some cases, the movie went under the code name Blue Harvest to avoid any price gouging. Is that, is that technically smurfing? <laughs> <laughs> I think it might be. And of course, the infamous bikini, dubbed the slave outfit. <laughs> don't, know if, <laughs> don't know if you get a name like that in a modern Disney production, but uh, there we go. And that reminds me, Disney, don't think I haven't noticed the fact that you've changed the name of Boba Fett's ship from Slave One, which is what, it's what it's been known as for decades at this point, and they instead just label it as Boba Fett's Starship TM. <laughs> you absolute babies. Hey! You know, I never understood why Solo had to dupe that guy like that. There is way more of them. They're all armed. They could have just walked up to the guy like, what are you going to do? <laughs> you know, but no, uh, you know, Han Solo's like, I'll save the universe and all that, but not before a quick round of duck, duck, goose. And one thing I adore about Return of the Jedi is Luke's newly found bravado now that he's taken a Pilates class with Yoda one time. This, these delusions of grandeur that are immediately checked by each and every character that he tries it with. He tries it with Jabba the Hutt. Jabba the Hutt's like, hmm, ah, uh, hmm, uh, no, and shut up and go away. Allow me to introduce myself. I am Luke Skywalker, Jedi Knight and friend to Captain Solo. I'm sure that we can work out an arrangement which will be mutually beneficial. He's no Jedi. We're doomed. He tries it with Vader. He tells him, look, I know without doubt, unquestionably, that you are certainly, absolutely, definitely not going to be taking me to the Emperor. Are you, Father? And Darth Vader's like, uh, no, and then proceed to immediately take him to the Emperor. That's why you won't bring me to your Emperor now. <laughs> ah, unlucky mate. And then the Viet Cong attack, the big moon go boom, and we all know how Star Wars ends, don't we? It's true that a lot of the time, you don't want to know how the sausage is made. Being shown how the magic trick works, more often than not, ruins the magic. But the Star Wars trilogy is an exception to that rule. And I think it's a hallmark of a great movie when peeking behind the curtain actually has the opposite effect and you end up with a deeper respect and understanding. And I don't know if this applies to any of you guys, but I often prefer watching the makings of of some of my favorite films rather than those actual films themselves. I'm sure I've just been playing some footage of them, but uh, Lord of the Rings, Star Wars and The Incredibles actually are three of the best, in my opinion, three of the best behind the scenes documentaries that you can watch. Um, Lord of the Rings is obviously top dog, but The Incredibles, surprisingly underrated, very slept on. If you've not watched that before, highly recommend it. And please let me know in the comments if you do have any recommendations of your own. I'm always on the hunt for a good behind the scenes or a makings of kind of video. And I promise this is relevant, but just to briefly go back to the makings of The Incredibles, because it really helps to shine a light on the steep gradient of Disney's descent over the last decade or two. This was peak Disney Pixar. This is a team of people who are pushing boundaries creatively and technologically, but most importantly, having fun creating something genuine. It's really eye-opening to watch it these days and to see just how far they have fallen since then. <laughs> do it, do it, do it, man, because this is going to be so awesome if we get it right. And the reason that I bring this up is to reiterate a sentiment that you see echoed online a lot when you see Disney Star Wars or Disney as a whole being discussed, and that is that the magic is almost completely, if not completely faded. And as someone who has enjoyed behind the scenes content since I was a kid, watching it these days is just sad. The making of The Mandalorian season one is just depressing, if I'm honest. Granted, there was a great section that was dedicated to the 501st Legion, who they included in episode eight, though half of me wonders if they asked them to show up just to save on the budget, as they knew they'd all turn up in their own outfits. But it was nice to see them getting some respect. And you know, there was some pretty wholesome footage of Carl Weathers interacting with them. That aside though, it was just a bunch of waffle about the volume, which is as impressive as it is soulless. But it was essentially a four hour circle jerking session for the higher ups to see how far they could insert themselves into one another's rectums. And the reason that you don't see as much behind the scenes content these days is because 
No one wants to watch an actor on a harness being thrown around in front of a blue screen for the umpteenth time, spouting lines that are more often than not written by people who want to repave or just outright hate the IPs that they are paid exorbitant amounts of money to write for. Robert Rodriguez is the only man capable of pulling off a forbidden technique like that. What I'm saying is, is that Star Wars doesn't have the unadulterated passion that it used to have. Take Harrison Ford for an example. This was him after appearing in the sequel trilogy. I don't care. Now watch that same man, but this time whilst he was filming the original trilogy. And watch how he has to use his acting prowess to convey the danger of a blaster. Bang. Don't know it's too late! Bang. 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 Good God. It's like I'm really there. But joking aside, here's a clip of George Lucas from 1977 talking about why he thinks that A New Hope was so successful. And it's frankly frightening how relevant what he said almost 50 years ago at this point is becoming. I think one of the key factors in the uh, success is that it's a positive film. It has heroes and villains. It essentially uh, is a fun movie to watch. It's been a long time since people have been able to go to the movies and see a sort of straightforward, wholesome, fun adventure. If a director came out and said something like that today, it would be nothing short of a miracle. If that was the dialogue going into the next Star Wars film, I'm in. I'm on board. I would fall over, piss and shit myself, go to the cinema, watch that movie, come home, smile, and then clean up the piss and shit. But no, this is the dialogue we've got. We're in 2024 now, and I think uh, it's about time that we had a woman uh, come forward uh, to shape the story in a galaxy far, far away. How's it working out for you? Um, when I saw Frozen as a, as a grown ass woman, I, um, I cried through the entire movie. Mm -hmm. It just destroyed me completely, and I thought, Gosh, you know, I would love to make something like this. But rather than listen to someone who just clearly isn't a fan of Star Wars, how about we do the complete opposite? Because a little while ago, I asked you guys on the community tab on my YouTube channel why it is that the original trilogy is so important to you. And if you fancy a bit of a Star Wars white pill, I, you know, I recommend that you go and check that post out. A lot of you guys cited the ever powerful force of nostalgia and the fact that this was your first experience with sci fi sentiments that I share with you. But a recurring theme throughout the replies was its sense of hope, its clear cut morals, good versus evil, the complexity in its simplicity, and the fact that it represents a time when Hollywood was truly great and put entertainment and the audience before anything else. But by far, my favorite response was from FagelFan15, who said that the trilogy is important because it led to the creation of prequel memes. <laughs> that it did, my friend. That it did. I think a lot of people overlook the frighteningly simple explanation as to why the original Star Wars trilogy was so successful and why we'll unfortunately probably never see one like it again. And that is simply that it was born from the desire to make something that George liked the idea of exclusively with the intent to entertain. Sure, you could write that notion off as charmingly naive, but that raw and pure intention is what helped to define the original trilogy. You know, you can paint a petri dish green, it doesn't make it penicillin. You know what I'm saying? Studios continue to underestimate the power of organic passion and the knock-on effect that has on a film that you're producing and in turn, the audience watching it. The magic of Star Wars does not lie only in its brilliant special effects. Its power derives from something simpler and rarer, the romantic spirit that moves in it. Before it, we are all young again and everything seems possible. He completely revolutionized the film industry as a whole and single-handedly pulled movie-making culture out of what was a particularly dark era at that time. And I can't help but feel like we're here again. 2024 is like the 70s all over again, before the release of A New Hope. And that's what the, I feel like that's what the entertainment needs right now. It needs A New Hope. We need the next George Lucas to come along. Some of you might say that's already happened and that was Peter Jackson. And sure, you know, I can see that, but we're gonna need another one, I'm afraid. And, you know, the sooner the better, ideally. But until Disney have a complete staff overhaul or sell Star Wars, we will almost certainly never see another Star Wars movie, anything like the original trilogy ever again. I look forward to seeing you in the next episode of Never Again. What movie, TV show, or video game should I dive into next time? Let me know down in the comments. And thank you very much for watching. I'll see you very soon.
thank you to all of you for uh, agreeing to do this and actually taking the time to uh, uh, to do this for me. It's, it's, as a Star Wars fan, to sit there and be able to listen to uh, that is it's, that is a dream come true. Uh, thank you ever so much, each and every one of you. Thank you. Thank you. And as always, a big shout out to the channel members and the Patreons we have. The top tiers, of course, these are the Knights of Law. Infinite Dum Dum, Puzzlebun, Flunky, David, Jax, Koss, ATS, Texas Lawman, Michael Tepia, Dagger D69, nice. Saint Nemo, Steve the Goat, Michael, Nystagmus, the Grand Admiral, Jordan96, and September Kano. To each and every one of you, I thank you for serving the realm. Of course, we have tier twos. Say, Dr. Malski, Yon, which had you, Canada Dog Ramachi, Mott Maiden, Sensei Fang, Mendicant Bias, Agent MO62, Stu Cheeks, Michael S, Rich Walwick, McLegend Face, Kidnap Tiger, and Say It. And of course, a big thank you to each and every one of the tier ones as well. And we're welcoming Corsabon and Witch Dr. Larry. Thank you to both of you for joining the Patreon. Welcome to the tier one, my friends. It's very good to have you. And there we go. Another day, another video. Will you join me for my next one? You better do, you little bitch. But until then, Take care of yourselves, and I'll see you very soon.